Today it's our delight to be speaking with Dr. Fole Legunda. Dr. Legunda earned a PhD in Missiology from Northwest University in South Africa and a Doctor of Ministry from Asbury Theological Seminary. He's the founder and executive director of the Africa Center for Interdisciplinary Studies in Kinshasa, the Democratic Republic of Congo, where we've reached him today. And he's also the author of the text that we'll be discussing, Transforming Missiology, an Alternative Approach to Missiological Education. Dr. Ligunda, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Thank you, Jonathan. Dr. Ligunda, we understand that transforming missiology, an alternative approach to missiological education, was first developed as your doctoral dissertation. How did you come to settle on the topic of missiological education as you developed your doctoral research, please? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I've been in the ministry since 1989. Uh, pastoring churches, evangelical churches in Congo. And uh, I came up with uh, observation about uh, what the churches are doing. Uh, I've been teaching at the Bible school, uh, seminaries, and uh, the administration of uh, the, the, the church. So the, the observation was that uh, Many of our uh, churches in Africa in general, but in Congo in particular, uh, which church were founded by Western mission societies, they are not so mission-minded churches. And that was a problem because uh, like in my denomination, we used to work with uh, American missionaries and uh, during the wars, they will leave Congo to go back to United States. And when we stay, we are just competing about material things. We will live in this uh, house left by missionaries. We will use this car uh, left by missionaries. Uh, they promote the, the title and the power. That, that was too much struggles. And I came up with this question saying, hey, so what is actually the, the main mandate of the church? Uh, if not going, uh, perpetuating what God, Jesus did, theological education we need in Congo uh, to prepare people for mission, to take uh, over the responsibility that uh, uh, Western missionaries uh, left to us. Dr. Ligunda, did the GPRO Congress in Bangkok of 2016 in any way shape your research or your thinking on this topic? My observation of uh, uh, church leaders not being so uh, mission-minded leaders, I, I think that was also the concern in that meeting you are mentioning. Uh, uh, when uh, I got this uh, report from my supervisor, Flip Bias, uh, I just said, wow, praise the Lord, because my concern is also shared by at a global level. Dr. Ligunda, one of the challenges facing theological colleges in the United States is the question of funding. That's a question that seems to come up uh, uh, perennially these days. And the traditional model of theological education simply requires enormous levels of financial support in order to make these schools operate. So the financial pressure on United States Bible colleges and seminaries is driving change and innovation. Uh, talk to me, if you would, about schools in the context of the Democratic Republic of Congo. How are finances working there? And what are the primary drivers of change in the context of the Democratic Republic of Congo? Uh, you know, Jonathan, this challenge is uh, universal. Uh, even in Congo, we are facing this issue for funding theological education. Uh, that is why in most institutions in Congo, even in other countries in Africa, uh, we uh, always look for support because churches are not uh, at the level of uh, taking in charge of uh, the training. And uh, most of our churches members, uh, they don't really uh, support the theological education and that is why funding theological education becomes a big challenge. But to address this challenge in my book, 
I propose uh, that uh, we should have uh, this uh, uh, blind model of training, whereby you will have people in their uh, workplace and uh, coming on campus uh, to spend like a few times, like a few weeks, where they can meet with uh, teachers and they can share their experience and they go back, students would go back to their job uh, so that uh, they may not be full time on campus, which is so expensive. And uh, also the distance learning, like uh, in South Africa, uh, you have uh, University of South Africa, uh, even in my own university, Northwest University, Purchase Room, they, they have this kind of uh, part-time uh, training and the research-based program. So those are ways that we are exploring nowadays to uh, address the issue of funding. Still, uh, it comes also with uh, other challenges because, you know, uh, traveling, the, the uh, students, the travel for students and uh, the payment of for professors and uh, you need good libraries like my center. We don't have a good library. Th those are challenges that uh, we need to address for the theological education. Still, we can change uh, training systems, training venue, training model, but uh, uh, we still need uh, money for the library, uh, for the travel costs, and, and so on. Dr. Legunda, you have a significant experience in several African countries, as well as, of course, the United States. Uh, the African countries would include Democratic Republic of Congo, South Africa, and Burundi, and perhaps others that I don't know about. Would you speak briefly to the ways that uh, um, the financial models and the technological models might might have a different, might possibly be different in some of these different African contexts? Yeah, uh, it's true. Uh, when you are in South Africa, uh, I think the internet connection is much more better than when you are in Burundi, where I have been for six years. And uh, I can't tell about Congo, uh, even for this program. Uh, you see how we struggled before we come up with uh, what we are doing. I, I don't, I'm not even sure if we will uh, end up with a good uh, internet connection. So uh, in South Africa, you have a better, good, much more better than in Burundi, in Congo, and so on. And the internet connection is still a problem. It is still a problem. I hope, I hope we'll have a way to uh, overcome this challenge. Dr. Ligunda, would you be willing to brainstorm with me just on that point, the, the, the point of technological infrastructure and, edu and internet availability, particularly in the context of, of uh, Democratic Republic of Congo? Um, uh, is this your first time on a Zoom conference call? And, and have you, uh, for church leaders, is there a use of teleconferencing on the internet? Uh, I'm fortunate to be a scholar. So that is not the first time to use a Zoom conference, but many of my colleagues, they don't have this opportunity. Uh, you know, uh, I have uh, my laptop, I have my modem, but not many pastors. Uh, uh, it, it's really a challenge uh, for uh, 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 other people, but for scholars like me, I, I have this chance of traveling getting this kind of material, but it's not common to many people. That's, that's very helpful that you would help me think this, these uh, questions through. So, um, uh, Dr. Ligundo, we are, we are in, at Moody envisioning, at the Center for Global Theological Education, we are envisioning a global network of, of learning communities, and we are envisioning that we would be able to partner with schools around the world through a hybrid model of both live teaching events and also mm -hmm. internet calls like we're doing now. Can, would you be willing to counsel me just briefly, um, in the context of Democratic Republic of Congo, how difficult would it be and what, what would be required to set up internet learning communities within churches? The, the, the telecommunication uh, agencies, they are here, um, they provide Provide, they provide uh, like modems 
and you can have a screen and uh, also uh, a good uh, laptop. So like in my center, a uh, few months ago, I was in South Africa and my students were here in Kinshasa. So uh, when I was speaking from South Africa, they were so amazed to see me through uh, the, the internet connection. And instead of bringing all students to South Africa, you see uh, one student would pay like $1,000 to go to South Africa. But uh, that time they were here, right here, and they listening to me from South Africa. I, I think there is a way uh, if uh, we can have this kind of, kind of uh, materials of uh, having a room like uh, what we have here, but uh, uh, having a screen and these uh, disposals things, uh, it can be a good thing uh, to uh, cut down some costs uh, that we, can, uh, we cannot afford. And, and this experience of yourself teaching from South Africa to your students in Kinshasa, what, when was that? How, how many weeks or months ago was that? Uh, it, it, was, uh, we, we, uh, it was in May. And can you describe to me what was it like for you as a teacher to teach through that medium? Yeah, it, it was good because, uh, you know, that, that, that was an uh, international conference uh, organized by Northwest University, and I was one of the speakers. And uh, when I was there and I told my students to be connected so that they may follow all the conference, it was on apologetics because due to this issue of uh, cults. And uh, I, I gave a paper on the missiological perspective of approaching sect or cult. And that, that was powerful for our students to learn not only from me, but from other professors who could not uh, uh, come here, or our students would, uh, could not go there. So it was uh, really a, a blessing for them. Yeah, it was a blessing. Even for myself, I was proud because uh, my colleagues who were in the room, they said, oh, we have a student from Dr. Foley's center. So uh, it, it was really grateful uh, for, for me. We're honored today to be speaking with Dr. Fole Ligunde, author of Transforming Mission, an Alternative Approach to Missiological Education. Dr. Ligunde, uh, I think the million dollar question for us today is, what does mission look like in this globalized post-colonial world of ours? How has mission uh, in the 21st century and looking on to the end of the 21st century changed from the 20th and previous centuries? Yeah, this is, this is actually a critical question that I'm discussing also in that book, uh, using the concept global, global. Uh, that means the mission should be both local and also global. Uh, the, the tendency in many churches in Congo is that uh, our mission field is here. So in my book, I say no, the mission field is not only here. We start from here, but uh, here is not the final destination of our mission. Because Jesus said, uh, when the Holy Spirit will come upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all the Judea, in Samaria, and uh, at the utmost of the earth. So uh, we say the mission should not be only here, here and there. And usually I tell my people, you know, when I go to United States, people are waiting for African missionaries as well. In the past, uh, American missionaries went from American to Africa. But nowadays, you go to America, you find so many unreached people. Uh, and, and you see, uh, I gave even one example. In 2003, I visited uh, United States. And I preached in one church with uh, a membership of uh, 18 members. When I went in 2006, I preached in the same church with uh, uh, almost eight members. When I went back in 2008, the church building was sold out. The church was sold out. There was no more church there. And I tell my people, look at here, everywhere you find the church. 
but in America, they are selling some churches. So uh, we, missionaries for nowadays should come from Africa, from America, from Asia. It's a global, a, a global game. And we should not be only observers. We should be actors in that game. The other aspect also is the holistic approach of mission. Uh, because uh, some missionaries in Congo used to say, bless are you poor people. Uh, it looks like if you are poor, you, your destiny is the paradise. You cannot be a rich person when you are in Christ and so on. But nowadays we say, no, Jesus Christ came for a holistic ministry. He was caring about the whole human being, body, soul, and the spirit. So the mission should be a holistic, a holistic program to reach out to whole human being. So uh, in brief, to respond to your question, for me, as I discussed in my book, the mission should be global, both for local and global, and also holistic. Dr. Ligonda, thank you so much for that reflection. How does missiological education need to change in order to prepare students effectively for missionary service in the coming century? I, I, I think my, my uh, proposition is that uh, the theological education should be in the service of God's mission. So in that sense, missiological education should penetrate the whole curriculum of theological education. Uh, instead of uh, having only uh, a department of uh, missiology, for me, I think uh, to make theological education in the service of uh, God's mission, we should, uh, the, the systematic theology, historical theology, uh, biblical theology, should be uh, embodied in mission like uh, Christopher Wright, he, he, he did a great job writing, uh, publishing his book, The Mission of God. The, 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 the whole things in a theological institution should, be, should have the purpose of serving church and its mission. So you cannot just say, unless you go to the Department of Missiology, you cannot learn about mission. Uh, as I demonstrate in this book, I say even a practical, uh, practical theology should be a channel through which mission of God should be taught to students. Uh, systematic theology uh, can be in the service of uh, mission. Uh, New Testament, Old Testament, all these things. So for me, missiological education should not be just like an island. It should be part of the whole theological education. Dr. Ligunda, we're delighted to be speaking with you today on your text, Transforming Missiolo Missiology, an Alternative Approach to Missiological Education. Dr. Ligunda, would you be willing to talk to us about uh, the reasons why you founded the, uh, the Africa Center for Interdisciplinary Studies in Kinshasa? Yeah, um, the Africa Center for Interdisciplinary Studies uh, came out of my uh, doctorate because it, it was actually as the answer to the problem that I was addressing in my research. Uh, the observation is that uh, many people here, uh, they don't have uh, this opportunity of uh, um, furthering their studies for several reasons including funding money, including uh, the place where they can go and uh, learn those things. And that is why I say, let us come up with this uh, center we'll, that, that will open, open up to all people from all denominations. Because when you have uh, some seminaries, they are there for their denominations. Uh, like if you have a Baptist seminary, this is for Baptist members. If you have a seminary for Presbyterian Church, this is for Presbyterian Church. 
But in Congo, we have uh, so many churches which are not only member of Protestantism, they are African initiative churches, and we have strong leaders in those people, but they are not educated. So I said, if we could set up a center which, can help, which, which will help all people from all denominations without discrimination, and this can be a good thing. Also, um, you, you have uh, some institutions which are not really providing a well, high quality education. Uh, this is a general problem in many countries in Africa. And uh, for me, I said, since I'm connected with uh, Northwest University, which is a good, which is a good university, uh, the center will recruit people we lead them through the completion of a research proposal, and we bring all the file for their admission to the Northwest University where I studied. So that, that is one of the reasons why I established uh, this center. Another reason is about uh, uh, publications. In Francophone Africa, we are known as uh, not really being people who are publishing a lot, mostly in evangelical side, uh, evangelical Francophone Africa, they are not publishing a lot. So I said, let us through this center have a student conduct the research. At the end, we publish the research, like my book. My book is, is from the thesis, but uh, you, you come to many institutions here, their dissertations are not published. They just in the library, they are not. Uh, these are some reasons why I established this center here. Dr. Ligunda, would you be willing to talk to us about some of the programs that your center, the Africa Center for Interdisciplinary Studies, offers? Yeah, uh, we have uh, the, the first programs. Uh, actually, as you can see, interdisciplinary. Uh, we receive people from all the Department of Theological Studies. Uh, that means systematic theology, uh, biblical theology, uh, practical theology, historical theology. So we receive all those to come to our center, uh, but with the purpose to use the research for missions. You can do systematic theology, but you connect it uh, with mission and uh, historical with mission, biblical mission, and so on. The second thing is uh, we also organize uh, research seminars. Uh, very soon in August, we'll have uh, one research seminars for students who are doing master's and doctorate program from various universities, not only from our universities. So we'll be here because the issue of methodology, many students, they are not aware of, and uh, one of my friends from Biola University, Professor Richard uh, Starcher, will come as one of the facilitators to help uh, uh, the participants in area of uh, literature review, uh, research methodology, and uh, plagiarism, and so on. We also uh, uh, have a review, Africa Review for Interdisciplinary Studies those who want to publish their articles or part of their dissertations, they will submit, they will submit the proposal and we will, we will edit. This is a peer review um, journal uh, to disseminate uh, what uh, our people are doing. So those are a few things that we are uh, offering at master's and uh, doctoral level. Dr. Ligunda, if I may close this interview with a question that we've been asking all of the interviewees on this program, and that is this, what would it mean for the church to be united today? How would we recognize this unity, and what is it that we can do to pursue the unity for which Jesus prayed in John 17? Yeah, uh, this is a great question, and you know, jo Jonathan, the last prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17, uh, when it like uh, verse 23 uh, 20 to 23 
Jesus said, Lord, uh, Father, I pray that uh, these people will be one as you and I, we are one, so that the world may know that you sent me, so that the world may believe. You see those two verbs, to know and to believe. Many people in the world, they don't know Jesus Christ. Many people in the world, they don't believe in Jesus Christ. And the unity of uh, people of God will facilitate people around the world to know Jesus and to believe in him. So uh, in Congo, we have a wonderful uh, example of the Church of Christ in Congo, where you find all Protestant churches in one platform. And uh, you leave this church, you go to the other church, you, 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 you have this feeling of belonging. And I think that is very important. And uh, when I look at the issue of a theological education, we need this kind of uh, uh, approach also to open up to all people. Uh, we cannot just say, I'm in the Baptist seminary, uh, you are in the Lutheran seminary, you are in the Reformed seminary. I, I think uh, uh, our diversity should be uh, the wealth uh, for us to be together and to provide uh, uh, what God's people need for his mission. Yeah, uh, unity is very important thing. It can be a tool for the world to know Jesus and to believe in Jesus. It's been our delight today to be speaking with Dr. Fole Ligunde, author of Transforming Missiology, an Alternative Approach to Missiological Education, and also founder of the, the and executive director of the Africa Center for Interdisciplinary Studies in Kinshasa, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Thank you so much, Dr. Ligunde, for joining us this morning. Thank you very much, Jonathan. God bless you.